Good morning and welcome to Food for Thought. My name is Pastor Clint Lang from Hillside Community Church in 100 Mile House, BC, Canada. It's Friday, December the 18th. Hard to believe that we're approaching Christmas and we're right in the middle of our study on Advent. Um, so many good things that God has done for us in this life. And um, we've talked about hope, we've talked about peace. We're, we're focusing in on joy this week. And while reading different passages of scripture and articles on the joy of Christian living, I, I came across an article in the Christian Courier on the seven habits of joy. I thought it was so good. I, I'd like to share with you the thoughts and content of this over the next two Food for Thoughts. Um, joy is the serious business of heaven, wrote C.S. Lewis in a letter to a friend. It ought to be our serious business as well. Joy is every believer's birthright. Scripture assures us of this through repeated promises. The Christmas season underscores the fact. The, the angel who announced Jesus' birth did so with the words, I bring you good news of great joy. And we see that in Luke chapter 2, verse 10. So then why is joy so elusive? Why, for so many Christians, does joy remain tantalizingly out of reach? like a vapor that vanishes the moment we try to grasp it. I believe that in part is the reason that we expect joy to arrive like a bouquet of flowers on an anniversary, when in fact it is more like a bed of flowers that needs to be cultivated in order to flourish. Joy comes through discipline rather than serendipity. Joy comes, in other words, when we make it our serious business. Anyone starting a journey should know where he or she is headed out before they set out. This is true of the journey towards joy as well. It's possible to miss the destination of joy because we don't know what it looks like to arrive. Most of us know that biblical joy is not the same as happiness. Happiness is rooted in fortunate circumstances while joy comes from a deeper place within. Nonetheless, many Christians persist in believing that if we have God-given joy, we should be able to float, kind of zen-like, with detachment over all of our circumstances. And this is a misleading picture. It's not scriptural at all. The Bible never promises us an escape from complex emotions. Joy may be experienced in the midst of circumstantial happiness, but it can and often does coexist along with great inner struggles. Paul informs us Christians are not immune to physical pain or mental perplexity. The apostle was experiencing both when he described himself as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. We see this in 2 Corinthians 6.18. Paul had joy, but not joviality. To seek joy is not to aspire to bliss. Rather, is to foster a certain attitude towards life. It is a set of the heart, like the set of sails that allows a ship to keep going in the right direction, no matter which way the wind is blowing. This is the destination we are seeking when we journey towards joy. And to arrive at it will require a steady development of our character and an increasingly habitual trust in God. With this in mind, I propose the, seven, the, the following seven habits of joy. Number one, talk to yourself. We are inclined to think that people who talk to themselves are strange. Timothy Keller of the Redeemer Presbyterian Church begs to disagree. He says that, in fact, most of us spend far too much time listening to ourselves and not enough time speaking to ourselves. We return routinely listen to negative talk and entertain despairing voices that tempt us to fear and doubt. But sometimes we need to take ourselves firmly in hand and say to ourselves, now hear this, hear the words of the Lord. Among the things we need to tell ourselves is just deeply how deeply God loves us. He sent his son to secure our place in his family and he didn't invest that much only in to leave the job of saving and sanctifying us half finished. 
Nothing can separate us from his love, and we see this in Romans chapter 8, verse 32. Talking to ourselves is not the same as giving ourselves a pep talk. It means listening to our deepest concerns well enough that we can reason ourselves back to a place of believing. I know that sounds funny, but David models this kind of self-talk in Psalm 103 in his introductory words. Bless the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, bless his holy name. Mark the whole psalm as an address to self. The author of Psalm 42 similarly speaks to himself when he says, Why are you so downcast, O my soul? Rest. Number two, rest. God created us both as soul and body and spirit, and he prescribed a Sabbath day as a way of stewarding our physical and mental resources. Do you live in a healthy life rhythm that includes both activity and rest? When was the last time you got eight hours of sleep? Taking care of our physical bodies is a spiritual matter. Our level of physical well-being will affect our sense of God's nearness. Many people who feel joyless and discontented from God are in reality just really tired. Praise. Number three, praise. Praise forces us to refocus our attention from our problems to God. We should praise God regularly even if we don't feel it. This will seem inauthentic to some because our culture puts a high priority on feelings, but it isn't. We should praise God because He is worthy of it, not because we feel like it. When we praise God just because of who He is and thank Him regularly for what He has done, Feelings of joy frequently follow in the wake of our obedience. The alternative to praise and thanksgiving is joyless, bitterness, and complaining. These are joy stealers of the worst kind. Pray that you would ponder these thoughts today. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.